So this talk is sort of follow-up of a talk I gave last year, but in some sense it's entirely disconnected. Uh, that's a talk in which I will explain the result, which is sort of algebraic result, <coughs> but which will be proved using uh, analytic techniques, essentially the idea of the so-called hypoelliptic Laplacian. <coughs> but I will come back to this later on. So my talk will be organized this way. First of all, I will give a short introduction. <coughs> then I will explain what exotic Hobbes theories are from the analytic point of view. <coughs> then I will review this riemann roch grothendieck theorem essentially in three uh, trivial cases. And then finally, I will try to explain what the proof consists of. So first of all, a brief introduction to Bautzen cohomology. So Bautzen cohomology is a refinement of ordinary Durham cohomology. So you give yourself S to be a complex manifold, dimension N. And Bautzen cohomology consists in taking, instead of quotienting by the image of Durham, like in usual Durham cohomology, you quotient by the image of the d bar d. So in other words, you define the HPQ by degree PQ, BC for Bautzen, as being the kernel, the closed forms in omega PQ, quotient by the D bar D of omega P minus 1, Q minus 1. So for compact Kähler manifolds, this is the same thing as the RAM cohomology, but in general, the Bautzen cohomology is strictly finer than the RAM cohomology. So I will define in the talk H equal to be the direct sum of the HPP in Bautzen cohomology. Now, a simple fact is that holomorphic vector bundles do have characteristic classes which lie in the Bautzen cohomology. So how do you see this? You take a holomorphic vector bundle you put a Hermitian metric on it, and you look at the corresponding churn veil representative of the associate characteristic class. Now, the theory of Bott and Churn says that not only is this form a sum of PP forms whose cohomology class does not depend on the metric, but its Bott Churn class does not depend on the choice of the metric, which means that the difference of two representatives can be actually written canonically as a difference of d bar d of something. So what is the theorem of riemann roch grothendieck that we talk about? So I give myself p, m2s, to be a proper submersion of complex manifolds. So the fiber xs, p minus 1 of s is supposed to be compact. And I also give myself f to be a holomorphic vector bundle on m, on the total space. So the theorem is as follows. So I will assume that the direct, so-called direct image of F to be locally free. So what this means in this context is that actually the cohomology groups of F along the fibers XS are of locally constant dimension. So in this case, the direct image is indeed a holomorphic vector bundle. So that's a very strong assumption that I will comment upon briefly later on. And so then the theorem takes the familiar form of riemann roch grothendieck but except that every time there is a characteristic class or an equality, you have the suffix BC for Bautzen to it. So the Chern character Bautzen is equal to the integral along the fiber of the Bautzen class of Todd relative tangent bundle time the churn character of f. So a brief comment on the assumption on locally freeness. In general, on arbitrary complex manifolds, there is, for the moment, no good definition of the churn character for a covariant sheaf. The direct image in general by Grauert's theorem is known to be a covariant sheaf, but we don't have a good definition for the churn character. So that's why we need, in this case, to assume the direct image to be locally free for the left-hand side to make sense. 
a refinement of this is that without any assumption, the first churn class of the determinant bundle, so in this case there is a determinant bundle of the direct image, it's a honest line bundle, and the equality holds in full generality. So this theorem is true without any assumption on the manifolds M and S of algebraicity, projectivity, and so on. So let me make two remarks on this. First of all, the smooth version of this identity, that is, if you map this identity to the Durham cohomology, it's a known identity. It follows from the family's index theorem of Atiyah Singer, which implies the Durham version of this result. And the second thing is that, say, if M and S are projective, the result follows from the theorem of riemann roch grothendieck itself. So our goal is to obtain a proof of this result without any assumption on the manifolds M and S. So now, exotic Hodge theories. So I will explain, first of all, a Hodge theory without a metric. So let me give myself X to be a smooth, compact manifold. So I claim that it is possible to scale properly the intersection product on smooth differential forms so as to obtain a non-degenerate Hermitian form. So in other words, the intersection product on forms is neither symmetric nor antisymmetric. It depends, the symmetry or antisymmetry depends on the degree. But I claim that there is a canonical way to scale it by proper powers of minus 1 or of i, so as to obtain a non-degenerate Hermitian form. So let me give elementary examples here. In the case of dimension 1, I here wrote the pairing between a form of degree 0 and a form of degree 1 with the power of i in front of it. So a more interesting case is a case of Riemann surface. So here is the proper pairing between a form of degree 0 and form of degree 2. I take them here to be complex values. So here is you have minus i integral of alpha wedge beta bar. In degree 1, it's i alpha wedge beta bar. And in degree 2, it's i alpha wedge beta bar again. So, in general, this can be done for any uh, dimension. So, the point is that this sort of Hermitian forms is of signature infinite, infinite. So, contrary to the classical L2 Hermitian products on which Hodge theories are usually based, we will work with Hermitian forms of signature infinite, infinite. So let me try to compute the adjoint of the Durham operator with respect to this specific Hermitian form. So let me call D star to be the adjoint of D with respect to this proper normalization of the intersection product. So what you find is that the Durham operator becomes a self-adjoint operator d star is equal to d, so that the corresponding Laplacian, Hodge Laplacian, d and t commuted with d star is equal to zero. So having a Laplacian which is equal to zero in some sense, I mean it's a good thing because it's a very simple identity, you cannot do much of it. Zero is not an elliptic operator, it is neither a hypoelliptic operator, but what this means in some sense is that since our ultimate goal or purpose, I mean technical tool, will be to produce uh, something whose Laplacian is not elliptic, at least we're going into the right direction. <laughs> okay, so if M is complex, then the adjoint of the D-bar operator becomes the D operator, <laughs> the adjoint of D star becomes D bar, of course. 
so that I will now review briefly the case of a Hermitian vector bundle. So you give yourself E, G, E, nabla E. Well, I mean, the manifold, the manifold is not equipped with a metric, right? I just okay. based the pairing of forms on the intersection form. So there is no metric yeah. at all. But now you're bringing it back. Now, I'm bringing it back on the, on the vector bundle. This is for you. Okay. But, I mean, so what I'm just saying is that if you have a vector bundle with a metric, the connection operator itself, viewed as acting on smooth forms with values in the vector bundle, becomes a self adjoint operator. So nabla E becomes equal to nabla E star, and so the curvature of the vector bundle, which in the proper formalism is just a square of the connection, becomes itself a Hodge Laplacian. So it's a Hodge theoretic Laplacian, which actually takes values in nilpotent operators. Now, from the analytic point of view, nilpotent operators are frowned upon. But it will turn out, actually, that they will provide, I mean, in some sense, they will be integrated in the whole theory. So let me now just, again, cover the case of a complex manifold. I consider M to be complex and omega to be a real one, one form. So with respect to this Hermitian form eta based on the intersection pairing, I claim that multiplication by i times omega is a self-adjoint operator, becomes a self-adjoint operator. So that actually, we can define a new pairing. Now, it's a pairing with a metric, if you like, or with a Kähler form, I should say, where you pair alpha with the exponential of minus i omega, where the exponential it takes is taken in the space of forms. In other words, it's a zero plus a two form, etc. So this is again a Hermitian form. If you compute the adjoint with respect to this new Hermitian form, you find that d star is given by d minus i d omega. d bar star, the adjoint of d bar, is equal to d minus i d omega. So that ultimately the Durham Laplacian, the classical Durham Laplacian, d anti-commuted with d star is equal to zero. And the holomorphic Laplacian, d bar anti-commuted with d bar star, is in this case the d bar z of the two form. Okay, so this d bar d of this two form will come, on, come out recurrently in the talk. So these seem to be exotic Hodge theories, I mean having nothing to do with Hodge theory, but as we shall see later on, ultimately they appear in the proper compatification of Hodge theories. Let me finally point out that the holomorphic Laplacian in this case vanishes if and only if d bar d of omega is equal to zero. Now, let me just state a key idea in the proof of the riemann roch grothendieck theorem I stated before. It will be uh, ultimately based on an interpolation between classical Hodge theory and the above degenerate Hodge theories through a family of hypolyptic Hodge Laplacians, which have the best features of both theories. So, in some sense, I mean, you might think that the interpolation between a Hodge theory based on a positive Hermitian form and another one which is based on a Hermitian form which is of signature infinite, infinite is not possible. But actually, it will ultimately be possible because these non-classical Hodge theories I will describe actually take place on a bigger space than the original manifold. So let me now describe trivial cases of the theorem I want to prove. So the first case is the case where actually there is no fiber at all. The fiber is just made of a point. M is equal to S. The fiber X is a point. And the equality in this case will turn out to be very simple. The second case, trivial case, is a case where S is a point. 
And the third case will be the case of what I will describe as a Kähler vibration. So these two cases, extreme case, m equals s, fiber is a point, and the case where s is a point will serve as token or toy model for what we will do later on. So the case first where the fiber is a point. So I take here m equals to s, f to be the trivial line bundle, and the theorem to be proved in this case is a known fact, at least in this audience, that one is equal to one. Now, the case where S is a point. The case where S is a point exactly says that in some sense the riemann roch hirzebruch formula is true for an arbitrary complex manifold without projectivity or algebraic conditions. So if X is projective, this is exactly riemann roch hirzebruch If X is scalar, Actually, this directly follows from the methods of, let's say, local index theorem for the classical Dirac operator dx equals d bar x plus d bar x star. But in general, if x is non kähler it also follows from a T.S. Singer index theorem by a deformation of the operator, the original Dirac operator, in the smooth category to uh, the classical, let's say, Dirac operators. Did they use half the system? No, no, not at all. But the point is that exactly the, where the proof, I mean, where this sort of deformation cannot be used anymore in that context, is that the idea of smooth deformation, in some sense, preserves the information that you want to get in the Dirac cohomology but destroys the, inf the information you want to get in the Bochern cohomology. That is that exactly this sort of smooth deformation, which is authorized in some sense in the ambient of smooth elliptic operators, that we cannot use anymore in this context. So an aside will be how actually can we prove riemann roch irzebro itself analytically while preserving d bar x. So this will again serve as a token model. It has nothing to do a priori with the problem of families. Is how to prove riemann roch itzebro itself while preserving the holomorphic structure of the problem. So let me go now to a non-trivial case, that's the case of Kähler vibrations. So a vibration is said to be Kähler if there is a closed 1-1 one -one form on the total space of the vibration, which gives you cell which is fiber-wise positive. <coughs> so typically, this is the case if all the manifolds are projective, and more generally, if the projection is projective. So using results of Gillet and Sully and myself, using in this case, in this specific case, where the fibers are Kähler, but also they can be fit in a whole of sort of Kähler family, using fiber-wise elliptic Hodge theory and its deformations, one can actually construct forms on the base, on the base S, alpha T, which interpolate in some sense as forms between the two sides of the riemann rohr grothendieck formula that we have to prove. So I wrote here alpha zero, which is the integral along the fiber of the taut form of Tx times the churned form of the vector double f. In this case, I've equipped f with a, with a Hermitian metric. So on the right-hand side, this is a well-defined form computed locally. And also at infinity, you have the churn character form of the direct image, or if you like, of the fiber-wise cohomology, which is computed using the metric which comes from fiber-wise Hodge theory, that is, by identifying the cohomology to the corresponding harmonic forms. So I claim that there is a natural interpolation between these two forms through a family of closed forms, and in effect, whose variation, d over dt, 
is equal canonically to the d bar d of something. Okay, so by integrating the above <coughs> equality, <coughs> you can ultimately produce forms on the base which solve, in some sense, the problem which is at hand. That is, it tells you the difference between the left and right hand side of the formula in the riemann roch grothendieck formula, if you take the difference, it's canonically given by the d bar d of some form, and so it immediately gives you <coughs> the riemann roch grothendieck formula that you want. So in other words, there is a certain analytic machine that I will not explain <coughs> based on Quillen's superconnections, which more or less uses the fiber-wise Hodge theory and its deformation, but essentially in a category which is the Kähler category. Sorry? Of course, I mean that I compute determinants. Okay. So actually, the term of degree zero, the term of degree zero of this T, is exactly the Racinger analytic torsion of the fiber. Yes? Yeah, but I mean, if you take the degree two piece of this, if you just take the degree two, right, that's an equality about the C1s. <laughs> and so more or less what this tells you, actually, as you will see on the next line, for the C1, this gives you, in this context, the curvature theorem for Quillen metrics, if you interpret it properly. Right, so this T, my talk is not about this T, but in some sense T0 is a known invariant. That's the analytic torsion of the fiber. And if you understand what I wrote properly, that gives you the curvature theorem for Quillen metrics. Now, let me go back again to the case where the fiber is a point. So if you assume the fiber to be a point, first of all, I claim this is a vibration which is scalar. It's a Kähler vibration because simply by taking the Kähler form to be zero, it of course induces a metric along the fiber since there is no fiber at all. So in this case, actually, the form alpha t, which I mentioned before, by picking up the right choice of omega m, these forms are equal to one for any t, and so indeed they interpolate between one and one. Now, let's try to forget about the Kähler property. That is, let's forget about the fact that this vibration, in some sense, is trivial. So, and formally imitate the proof of this uh, result in the Kähler category in the, in the Kähler case. But I will forget about this picking up the right form, omega m is equal to zero. So, let me explain what happens in this case. You pick an arbitrary one wave form omega s on s equals to m. And if you just proceed abstractly, that is, you reproduce formally the construction of the forms in the Kähler case, but without using the fact that the form is closed, then what you get is a form of this kind. Alpha t is equal to the exponential of minus i, the d bar d of omega s divided by 4 pi squared t. So you recognize here our old friends, this holomorphic Laplacian. <coughs> of course, from this formula, you find that alpha t is always equals to 1 in the proper Borchern cohomology. In other words, if you expand this form starting with 1, it's obvious that the difference is the d bar d of something. However, as t tends to zero, alpha t does not converge, <laughs> except if d bar d of omega is equal to zero, which is implied by the case where omega is closed. So what this means is that any method in the general case that would be based on an arbitrary omega form simply breaks down. And it breaks down again <laughs> because of the d bar d of the corresponding Kähler form. So actually, the term d bar d of omega appears because it is a Laplacian 
in the exotic Hodge theory of S. I mean, if you do the computation, you see that's exactly the reason for its appearance. Now, let me take again the case where the base is a point. So let me take x to be a compact complex manifold, and let me take omega x to be a Kähler form. Not necessarily closed. So it is positive, but not closed. So I then put dx equals d bar x plus d bar x star. So in 1989, I proved that there is, OK, let me say this literally, a local index theorem if and only if d bar d of omega is closed. So what does this mean? OK, so there is a well-rehearsed method, analytic method, which is based on the study of the heat kernel for the Hodge Laplacian, in this case for dx squared. And basically what this says is that one expect, I mean one expect in the good cases that this method will effectively produce a riemann roch itzebruch term, that is that there are certain local cancellations which happen. So actually what I had proved was that these cancellations only occur if d bar d of omega is equal to zero. So again, the sort of exotic holomorphic Laplacian that I exhibited at the beginning of my talk is in this context also the obstruction to prove a local index theorem. So let me briefly explain why the d bar d of omega is the obstruction to the proof in this case. So I wrote here the formula for the square of the Dirac operator, d bar d, d bar sorry, plus d bar star to the square, or the anti-commutator of d bar plus d bar star. So this is a formula of Weizenberg or of Lishnerovic's type. And you see in some sense there is here this term d bar d of omega, <coughs> which is a four form. And there is here a C which indicates that you map this four form into a corresponding element in a Clifford algebra. I don't want to go into this. But the main <laughs> algebraic point which explains why the proof will fail is the fact that this term is of length 4 in the Clifford algebra. These sort of local index theoretic methods only tolerate terms of length 2. As soon as you move to terms of length 4, the proof will break down. So these d bar d of omega now, which are introduced as a friend in some sense in the description of the exotic Hodge series, will ultimately turn out to be the enemy. So let me now go to the proof of riemann roch grothendieck of the theorem I stated at the beginning. When you can equip the manifold with a form omega m, which is d bar d closed. So I relax the closedness assumption, and I assume this form omega m to be d bar d closed instead of being closed. Then, by exactly imitating the construction of the superconnection forms based on the elliptic Hodge series and its deformations, actually, these forms alpha t still behave themselves when t tends to zero, so that ultimately we can still prove the riemann roch grothendieck theorem in this special case. In other words, we've been able to relax the assumption of closeness of the form omega m to the case where it is only d bar d closed. So, sorry? Yeah, they have a spectral gap. Yeah. You have to I mean, I took, I always in this case took the assumption that the direct image is locally free, so that actually you do not have phenomenal eigenvalues 
coming down. Okay, that's where <laughs> this comes in. So, I mean, yeah. So let me now cover the general case. So assume again the. D Sorry. Yeah. So assume the direct image to be locally free. And now pick again a form omega one one form which is positive along the fibers. And using fiber-wise elliptic arch theory again, we get superconnection forms alpha t. I don't explain to you how they are constructed. They are just based again on fiber-wise elliptic arch theory that represent the trend character of the direct image, but have no explicit limit as t tend to zero. And because there is no explicit limit as t tend to zero, and all our grasp of the <laughs> trend veil theoretic forms is based on these local index theoretic methods, this does not lead us anywhere. So if we remain in the realm of classical Hodge theory and its deformations, we're not able to prove the theorem. Except again in the case where d bar dm is equal to zero. So let me explain part of the solution. So I will introduce a new space X script. So for simplicity, I will work in the case of one single fiber. Okay, of course, the result to be proved is relative to a family, but for the moment, I restrict myself to the case of a single fiber, even if sometimes I will allow myself to export the result from the case of one single fiber to the case of a collection of them. So I introduce the total space of the tangent bundle. Let me call it X script. So that the total space of the tangent bundle, and I rename the fiber to be Tx hat. I rename it to be Tx hat to distinguish the fiber from the physical tangent bundle. So in other words, you have a bigger fiber space now, whose fiber is Tx hat, which is canonically isomorphic to the tangent bundle. So let me call y hat to be the canonical section of Tx hat, or of the pullback of Tx hat or of Tx hat, say. If you have the total space, you call the generic point y, y hat, and that gives you a tautological section of Tx hat. And then I call y to be the corresponding section of Tx. So what I will do is that I embed x in x hat as a zero section of the section y, or y hat. And then I use the so-called causal <coughs> resolution. So in other words, I introduce the holomorphic exterior algebra of the physical tangent bundle. And on it, I may act the contraction operator by the section Y. That's a so-called causal complex. And then finally, what I do is that I Dolbo resolve everything. Sorry, this is going too fast. Yeah. So I Dolbo resolve everything, which means that I, res I replace the sheaf of holomorphic sections by the corresponding smooth sections. So in other words, I finally introduce anti-holomorphic forms on X script, twisted by the exterior algebra of the base and the vector bundle on the base. So there is this extra twisting. And finally, I consider the sort of hypercomology operator, which is the debar of the total space X script combined with the contraction by Y. So if I grade things properly, this is a differential which increases the degree by one. You simply have to take in to grade this holomorphic exterior algebra negatively. 
So this operator A second B, there is a B constant here, which will serve as a parameter, defines a complex which is actually quasi-isomorphic to the original Dalbo complex on the base. So has this gone too far now? Let me see. Yeah. Sorry, I have to go back. Yeah. Which is quasi-isomorphic to the Dalbo complex on X. There is a restriction map which makes that this complex here, actually what it computes <laughs> is the cohomology of F on the base X. So this is where exotic hot theory will come in. So I claim that on this space of smooth forms on X script, twisted by the exterior algebra of X times F, I will introduce a duality, which is essentially intersection duality on the base. And Hermitian duality along the fiber. OK, so here is the formula for the duality. Please do not focus on the complexity of it. So here are forms on the base, which are exactly paired, as I said before. There is S here is the exponential of a certain Kähler metric on the base, you see the exponential here, S prime. And here is a pairing of the metrics along the fiber. So this pairing is just relies on two metrics, actually. There is a metric along the fiber, and there is a Kähler form of the base. It depends on two metric data. But observe that here, actually, this metric omega, you could as well take zero if you wanted to. So contrary to what happens in classical hot theory, we can now have a hot theory which is based on the zero metric. So the signs are chosen so that this form becomes a Hermitian form. We have our differential. We will take its adjoint with respect to this new bilinear form. But the final point is that, again, this form is of signature infinite, infinite. Contrary to the classical Ertulmetian product, we have a form of signature infinite, infinite. So let me briefly explain the evaluation of the adjoint. So I wrote here essentially the total differential as differential on the base plus the differential on the fiber plus the contraction by B square. This is the original differential. And now I will take its adjoint. So the adjoint of the differential on the base D bar is just D. This is what I explained at the beginning of the talk. The fiber-wise adjoint of the differential is a classical adjoint in the fiber. And here, OK, there is a bunch of terms I do not want to comment upon, just the fact that there is a B square missing in the denominator. So literally, the formula is wrong. So let me now explain how will the corresponding Laplacian look like. <laughs> That's the Laplacian for this new exotic hot theory. So it is not an elliptic operator. It is not classically self-adjoint. So essentially, it is made of two pieces. I mean, when I say essentially, let's say, and from the point of view of partial differential equations or as an operator, <laughs> there is a first piece here, which is a fiber-wise harmonic oscillator, which is self-adjoint. At the first piece. <laughs> well, I mean, here the Laplacian part depends on the first metric, and this y squared part depends on the second one. OK. Here, the second term is just a vector field on the base. It differentiates once. 
it is essentially the generator of the geodesic flow. Now, <laughs> there is a third piece, which is our old friend. Oh, now, I mean, it's now no longer ambiguous. It is our enemy. That's d bar d of omega x as a form now. And there is a bunch of other terms that I don't bother to write. Now, this sort of operator is analytically good. It's almost as good as the usual ordinary elliptic Hodge Laplacians, essentially because even though this operator differentiates only once in the base direction, <laughs> there is some complicity between these two pieces here, which means that this operator is hypoelliptic, <laughs> and actually it falls in a class of operators studied by Hermonda. In physics, it is related to the so-called Farquhar planck operators, so it is analytically good. It has compact resolvent, it has a heat kernel, it has a discrete spectrum, it has second everything. Order, second order. Sorry? Second order. It is second order. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so you don't need the full machine. No, no, no. No, 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 no. I mean, it's, you need the full amendment machine because it's only first order here in the base variables. So you need to bracket in some sense these things, these two things. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So. I mean, so the hard part of Amanda theorem is when there is the x zero. Okay, if that's the case where there is the x zero. Okay. So, let's forget about all this. What I'm claiming is that this Hodge theory and these sort of operators actually, when b tend to 0, deform the classical Hodge theory. OK, so the fact that it deforms classical Hodge theory, you cannot see it. I mean, it's not a visual deformation. The fact that it deforms it means that when b tends to 0, actually, the total space x script collapses to the space x. There is a collapsing phenomenon which makes that ultimately when b tend to 0, the fiber is eliminated. And this piece of degree 1 as a differential operator becomes an operator of degree 2. So that ultimately, this sort of operators deform the classical Hodge theory. So, this statement can be made extremely precise. When b tend to 0, we convert back to the classical Hodge. Yes, yeah, so basically, I mean, let's take the resolvent, take the heat kernel. You take the heat kernel. <laughs> what I claim is that the heat kernel converges to the heat kernel on the base, but it has to be made into a tuplets like operator. So, in other words, <laughs> along the fiber, Remember, we had this hypercomology complex, which actually computes the cohomology of the point. In this hypercomology complex, <coughs> the function 1 is represented by a harmonic form in this hypercomology complex, which is essentially a Gaussian form. So actually, <coughs> the convergence says that the heat kernel converges to the heat kernel on the base combined with the orthogonal projection along the fiber on this kernel. That's like a Riemannian collapsing. But of course, Riemannian collapsing will never change something we differentiate once into something we differentiate twice. So there is something really fishy there. OK? <laughs> so, but I'm saying that nevertheless, in spite of all the hype, <laughs> the hypoleptic theory still fails. So let me explain this. So except when d bar x dx omega x is equal to 0, we still do not have a local index theorem for this new theory. So the new superconnection forms alpha bt using this theory and its deformation. First of all, they remain in the same Bochan class as the elliptic ones. This is related to the fact of the collapsing phenomenon. In the proper Bochan cohomology, 
You haven't done anything. So what could, one could hope is that these new forms would be well behaved as t tends to zero. This is not the case because our now definite enemy, d bar d of omega x, is, which is still there and which hasn't done that we have not eliminated. So the alpha bt have a bad asymptotic as t tends to zero, which is essentially uncomputable, so we have not proved the theorem. So the proof of general riemann rogot and dick steel fails. So let me give you a solution now. So I told you at some point that there was an intersection pairing in which, which was based on the exponential of the Kähler form as a form, 1 plus a Kähler form, etc. I told you also at some point that nothing prevented you from taking the form omega to be 0. I mean, if literally speaking we had taken the form omega to be 0, her Hodge theory would have been the wrong one. We would not have had the harmonic oscillator, just the Laplacian, and our Hodge theory would have been based with an operator with continuous spectrum, which is something that we do not want. But I claim that still the Kähler form, omega x, can now be replaced, can now be scaled by the coordinate y, more specifically in the formula which defines the duality, I just replace the Kähler form omega x by its multiple by y squared. This form is completely degenerate when y is equal to zero. It stops being degenerate when y is not equal to zero. But of course, in the elliptic theory, you could never base a Hodge theory, a honest Hodge theory, on a metric which is zero somewhere. In the hypoelliptic theory, this is, in some sense, perfectly fine. What happens, actually, to this, what is a new Laplacian? I mean, the new Laplacian, the real difference is that the harmonic oscillator that we had before is now replaced by a quartic oscillator. The potential is now y to the force, essentially y to the force, which, from a physics point of view, still guarantees the fact that the particles are confined, the fact that the spectrum is still discrete. But the main point is that the bad guy, the d bar e i omega x, is now scaled by the norm of y squared, is now scaled. This is, was something that we could not do in the Hodge, classical Hodge theory. There is no way. The Kähler form is there. So actually, the new alpha bt's remain still in the same Barton class as the original one. This you can prove again by an argument of deformation. And when t tends to zero, the new alpha bt have a limit, which finally is compatible with the theorem we want to prove, that is essentially the limit is given by the Todd form, the integral along the fiber of the Todd form times the CH of F. Essentially. So in some sense, the proof Gaia goes by two successive deformations, elliptic to classical hypoelliptic, and then finally, finally we have to resolve ourselves to scale the Kähler form. Every time that's a heartbreaking sacrifice that we have to make, you know, to tradition, to deviate from tradition. But now I will finally explain something which I will call <laughs> the elliptic theory. So what I will try to, to show is that actually what we have done seems to be analysis, but it's actually more of a geometric nature. What I will do is I will go back again to our friend the case where the fiber is a point. The case where the fiber is a point, I remind you, the statement to be proved is the fact that 1 is equal to 1. So let me prove to show to you how will this come out from the general formalism I outlined before. So again, I pick up omega s to be a 1-1 one -one form on s, which is now completely arbitrary. And now, <laughs> I'm saying that if I do the scaling of this form, by the norm of y squared, y being a generic element in the tangent bundle 
to the fiber. Since there is no tangent bundle to the fiber, it is reduced to zero. This gives you the equality y squared times omega is equal to zero. Now, by proceeding abstractly, the form that you produced using this abstract nonsense formalism that I alluded to repeatedly without ever telling you what it was, by the way, what you get is the form alpha t is equal to minus this. But because this vanishes, this is zero. You get alpha t is equal to one. And so, ultimately, we have finally proved that 1 is equal to 1. But the point is that this proof now sort of is an application in a trivial case of a general recipe which works in all possible situations. So this is why I called it the elliptic theory because as you see, the main point of this is not to say that there is an elliptic or hypoelliptic operator acting along the fiber since there is no operator at all. Okay, but still, if you had proceeded in the wrong way, we would have produced divergences and be unable to prove that one <laughs> is equal to one. Okay, so I conclude here by a list of references, and I think I will stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>